We are now at module three of this video series, and our question for this module is, how do the institutions of the central government define and shape the character of a federal country? In this module, there are two lessons. Lesson one deals with how presidential and parliamentary political institutions affect the nature and functioning of a federal country. It also deals with the role that the upper house of parliament, often called the Senate, can play in a federal country. Lesson two deals with how political parties and different possible systems for electing governments can affect the functioning of a federal country. The information in these two lessons will provide the background for us to answer the module question. How do the institutions of the central government define and shape the character of a federal country? If you had the opportunity to create a federal country from the beginning, one of the first decisions you would have to make would be to choose the type of central government institutions. Almost all federal countries are democracies. However, there are many different kinds of democratic political institutions. Some federal countries have presidential systems. In these countries, the head of government, the president, is elected by the people and has powers independent of the legislature or parliament. These countries separate power between the legislature and the executive, headed by the president. The United States and a number of Latin American countries, including Mexico and Brazil, are among these. In parliamentary systems, the head of government is normally a member of parliament and derives power from parliament. There are many aspects which needs to which the UPA government should have done. Canada, India, Australia, and Germany have parliamentary systems. In parliamentary systems, there's also a head of state who has a ceremonial and limited constitutional role. The head of government has the real executive power. Germany's head of state, distinct from the leader of the government, is called president. <coughs> For Australia and Canada, the head of state is the British monarch, represented by a governor general. Some federal countries blend the parliamentary and presidential systems. In Russia, the president is elected by the people but must have the confidence or support of the parliament, the Russian Duma. In Switzerland, the parliament elects a seven-member executive council for a fixed term with the role of president rotating annually. The Swiss often say they do not have a president, but rather a presidency. In South Africa, the president is elected by parliament as both head of state and government, but is not a member of parliament. Argentina and Venezuela have very powerful presidents who have many powers unchecked by parliament. The central governments of almost all federal countries have what are called upper and lower houses of parliament. The idea is that the lower house represents the people throughout the country on an equal basis. The upper house is usually designed to represent the states or provinces or whatever the constituent units are called and to give them representation at the center of the country. Frequently, there is equal representation for each constituent unit in the upper house. In the United States Senate, for example, there are two senators for each of the 50 states, even though the largest state, California, is more than 100 times greater in population than the smallest state. Like the United States, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and Switzerland also have equal representation in their upper houses. Some countries have unequal representation. Austria, Belgium, 
Canada, Ethiopia, and Germany are among these. More populous units have more representatives than those with smaller populations. Germany has a very particular way of structuring its upper house, the Bundesrat. Governments of each of the German constituent units name their delegations to the Bundesrat. The Bundesrat must approve any laws that affect the constituent units. That means the German upper house has a powerful and important role in governing the country. In other federal countries, the powers of the upper houses vary greatly. The United States Senate is very powerful. It has all the powers of the House of Representatives, as well as the power to confirm cabinet secretaries and many judges, including those of the Supreme Court. The United States Senate must also approve all treaties and declarations of war. The upper houses of Argentina, Brazil, and Switzerland have an absolute veto power over all federal laws. The upper houses of Malaysia, Spain, and Austria can only delay federal legislation. The Upper House of Ethiopia acts as guardian of the federal system, serving as final interpreter of the Constitution. Before moving on to the next section, let's summarize what we have learned about the political institutions of the federal or central government. This time, instead of doing a true or false exercise, let's try another technique. In this module, we talked about the basic institutions of the central government. We referred to presidential systems, parliamentary systems, and blended systems that combine features of the two. This time, I will tell you something about a country's or group of countries' central political institutions, and you will say whether that country or those countries have a presidential, parliamentary, or blended system. Here goes. One, countries in which the president is head of state, leads the executive branch of government, has considerable power, and is elected by the people. The answer is presidential systems. Two, countries where the head of state is not elected by the people and has a largely ceremonial role. The answer is the parliamentary system. Three, countries where the head of government rather than the head of state has the real executive power. The answer is parliamentary system. For instance, in Canada, the prime minister has the executive power, whereas the governor general has a largely ceremonial role. And in Germany, the chancellor is the chief executive while the president is the ceremonial head of state. Four, countries where the power of the legislature and the executive is separate. The answer is the presidential system. In this section, we also talked about the role of the upper house, which is often called the Senate. Which of the following statements about upper houses are true and which are false. One, the upper house often represents the constituent units of a federal country. The answer is true. Two, in some cases, the upper house has very limited power. In others, it has power over such matters as international treaties and approving cabinet officers. The answer to this question is also true. For instance, in Canada, the upper house can generally only delay, but not stop legislation. While in the United States, the Senate, which is the United States upper house, must approve all senior court appointments and cabinet appointments. Three, the upper house is always on the second floor of the parliament buildings. That answer, of course, is false. Four, in one federal country, members of the upper house are chosen by the governments of the constituent units. True, in Germany, members of the upper house or Bundesrat are named by the governments of the lender or the constituent units. Five, members of the upper house 
come from the wealthy classes, while lower house members are from the poorer classes? Again, that answer is obviously false. Six, in some upper houses, there is equal representation for all constituent units, in others, it varies depending on the size of the units. The answer to this question is true. Countries such as Australia, Switzerland and the United States have equal representation in their upper houses, while countries like Austria, Germany and Canada have unequal representation. If you were creating a federal country from scratch, after choosing the form of political institutions, the next decisions would involve choosing the type of electoral system for the country. In proportional election systems, the number of seats a party gains is based on its share of the vote. At times, there can be one single district for the whole country. More frequently, there are a number of large electoral districts. There is usually a minimum percentage of the vote required before a party can get any seats. Often, that is 5%. Many countries use some version of the proportional representation system, which is often called the PR system, or simply PR. Among federations, those countries include Switzerland and Belgium. Those who support the PR system argue that it best represents the will of all the people. If there are groups in a country that are not geographically concentrated, for instance, the PR system will usually allow them to have some voice in Parliament. This is true for minority political tendencies as well as for minority ethnic communities. PR systems rarely give a single party a majority of elected members. They usually result in coalition governments where power is shared and government often based on consensus rather than winner takes all. The other main electoral system, usually called first past the post, quite often produces majority governments, but often leaves minority groups unrepresented. This system is used by such federal countries as Canada, Pakistan, and the United States of America. The majoritarian or first past the post electoral system provides for one member for each geographic electoral district. In many countries, when there are more than two people running for election in a district, the person with the most votes wins, and even if that's much less than half of all the votes. That's why they call it first past the post. An election is like a horse race. The first horse that passes the post wins, even if it's only a nose ahead of all the others. Some countries blend the two systems. In Germany, for instance, half of the members of the Bundestag, or Parliament, are elected by the proportional system, and the other half by first past the post. It has often been said that the first past the post system tends to produce uh, more aggregating parties and fewer political parties, so that you tend to get much more of a uh, two-party system compared to the P P PR systems. But when you look at federal countries, that's not always the case. And Canada is a very good example of a country where uh, the regional allocation of the vote has been very important. So that some, if the regionally based parties, such as we have now in Quebec in, in Canada or where we, such as we had in the 1930s on the prairies, the regionally based parties often got more seats than their share of the vote w would have indicated under a first-past-the-post system. And uh, you also have issues in a federal country that the first-past-the-post system can exaggerate the regional differences because the parties that do well in one area may get some vote in other areas but get no representation. The difficulty with PR systems is that they, they, they almost always do not produce majority governments. And so a lot of countries hang on to a first-past-the-post system because the dominant parties in the first-past-the-post system think, well, one day we're actually going to get our majority and it's a lot better 
as a party to be running a country with a majority government than having to have a, a coalition. But many federal countries, including some which are not all that regionally diverse, like Austria and Germany, have a long tradition of coalition governments, and they can be made to work. Having electoral systems means having political parties. Now we want to look more closely at political parties in federal countries and how they operate. Political parties are obviously critical to the operating, I mean, the, to the operation of modern democratic systems, whether they're federal or unitary. Uh, I'm not aware of any country that operates without political parties. I mean, you, you can find sometimes at the municipal level that they, they don't have political parties, but once you get into the, sort of these larger uh, units, whether they're countries or states or provinces within countries, they typically have a party system. Uh, but if you're looking at it from a federal perspective, I mean, one of the questions is, well, do you have parties which are national and which have an appeal right through the whole country? Or are the parties largely regional? And so, you know, my party represents uh, my province and your party represents your province and there's another party that represents another province. Well, obviously, the dynamics of a system are very different if all the parties are very regional as opposed to national because if you're in a national party you're always trying to get votes in all parts of the country whereas if you define yourself as just a regional party well you, you just have a narrower interest and so the whole way that compromises get made differs in these different systems in a system where you have very regional parties the compromises get made between parties in a system where you've got more national parties the compromises tend to get made more within the party because the party's still trying to reach out to, to different regions. And you can get countries where you get a mix of regional and uh, national parties. So the Congress party in India is still pretty much a national party. It gets votes in all parts of the country. But there have been a number of very significant regional parties that have appeared. And in some parts of the country, I mean, they do better than the, than the Congress party. So it's, it, these things affect the dynamics of a country and uh, I would say that generally one would hope at least to have some national parties as part of the, 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 the way the system operates if you're going to uh, build the kinds of bridges you want between regions. The United States has had a two-party system for well over a century. Democrats and Republicans dominate the political scene in the USA, even if the two parties have changed over time. The Republicans were the party of Abraham Lincoln, who led the northern states in a war against the secession of the southern slaveholding states and, in the process, ended the practice of slavery. Today, the Republicans are now quite strong in the former slave states of the South, while the Democrats are the party most favored by African Americans. Presidents of one party frequently have to work with a Congress dominated by the other party. As in many federal countries, the Democrats and Republicans are dominant at the state and even municipal level as well. Canada has a more volatile party system. Early in its history, Canada had two main parties, the Liberals and Conservatives, but now there are four parties represented in its federal parliament. There are also a number of strictly provincial parties, such as the Saskatchewan Party and the Secessionist Parti Québécois in Quebec. Germany has had a similar experience to Canada, there used to be two dominant parties, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats. Now there are a number of smaller parties that wield influence, including the Greens. The unification of West and East Germany has contributed to this trend. India was once dominated by the Congress party, but India too now has much greater diversity in parties. Mexico had almost one party rule under the Institutional Revolutionary Party for much of the 20th century. Now it has three major parties and a number of smaller ones. 
it is now common for Mexican presidents to have to work with a Congress in which another party is dominant. Belgium is an interesting case. There are now no national parties in Belgium, only Francophone and Flemish versions of each party. There is a Flemish Socialist Party and a Francophone Socialist Party, and the same is true for most other parties. There are also some parties exclusive to only one language group, such as an extreme Flemish Nationalist Party. In recent years, in Russia, one dominant presidential party has emerged from a previously very fragmented party system. Now that we've reached the end of this section, here are some questions to help reinforce what we have just learned. What type of electoral voting system does this country have? One, a country where the political parties gain seats based on their share of the vote. The answer is the proportional system. In a proportional system, parties gain seats based on their share of the vote. Two, a country which is divided into many electoral districts and each district elects one member. The answer is the first-past-the-post system. Three, a country that almost always has multi-party coalition governments. The answer is a country with the proportional system. Four, a country where it frequently happens that a party wins a majority of seats in parliament without winning a majority of the votes. The answer is a country with the first past the post system. Now let's go back to the question which started this module. How do the institutions of the central government define and shape the character of a federal country? To respond to this question, here's a multiple choice question and answer for you to try. A federal country can define and shape its character by choosing which of the following? A. Either a parliamentary or presidential form of government. B. An upper house to give weight to regions and special groups. C either a first-past-the-post, a proportional, or a mixed electoral system. D, either one dominant political party, two alternating parties, or multiple parties of very different sizes. E, either a political culture of winner-take-all, or one of consensus with broadly based governments and decision-making. F, none of the above. G, all of the above. The answer is G, all of the above. As we've seen in this module, federal countries choose institutions which can be parliamentary or presidential in form, use upper houses to give weight to regions and groups, use a variety of different types of democratic electoral systems, feature one dominant political party, two main parties, or multiple parties of very different sizes have a political culture of winner-take-all or one of consensus. <laughs>